Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome back to Crosspoint um, Cross Fellowship um, for our online church. While we, um, we're so grateful that we still get to gather here in the middle of a pandemic. If this is your first time with us, I welcome you. We're so glad that you're here. My name is Ronnie. I am the pastoral intern here at this church. And if you have any questions, any questions at all that you want to talk to, you want to know how we can best serve you, you know, reach out to me. Uh, you can re you can find um, a link to our website in the in the in the description of this video. I invite you to reach out. I also want to show you this nice virtual TV I have over here. Um, that that is going to be showing our slides. And I try my best to make everything big enough. But if it's not big enough, shoot me shoot me in the, something in the comments or let me know afterwards so that next time we can do better. Okay. Um, today we are going to talk about who is qualified to follow Jesus. And I invite you, if you don't yet have a have a Bible, go grab it, open it to uh, open it to Mark chapter two. We're going to be looking at Mark Mark chapter two for today. In recent years, as I travel to different parts of the world, I've learned to appreciate Toronto so much more than before. It's quickly becoming the ideal place to live and to raise a family for. Um, for, for, for me. And if you ask me what's so good about the city of Toronto, my number one answer is always diversity. It's diversity because 51% of the residents in Toronto were actually born outside of Canada. That's kind of crazy if you think about it. There, it's, an, it's, an, it's an astonishing stats. And I can't think of many cities that could say that, there's, that more than half of their citizens were born outside of the countries. Toronto is this diverse. And with, with this level of diversity, I find that the people in Toronto are generally very tolerant, very open-minded, and very respectful of people's backgrounds, religion, and their way of life. By and large, even though I think sometimes the media portray us as a divided society, but at a human-to-human -human level, Toronto is truly a champion of diversity. Now, having said that, I think it's still natural for people to associate with people who are like them. And for most of us in Toronto, we live in a bubble surrounded by people with similar life experiences to us. And I'm not saying that this is bad. I'm just saying this is inevitable, even in a diverse city like Toronto. You can see this quite clearly if you go to um, high, a high school or university, even in the workplaces here in Toronto. Some groups are divided by ethnicities. Maybe it's your lunch group. Some, they're divided by ethnicities. So you have the Caucasians, the Filipinos, the Indians. You have the Asians who were born in Canada. You have the Asians who just recently came to Canada. And some groups are divided by religions. So you got the Christian groups, the Muslim groups, the atheist groups, the, the groups that don't really care. You have some groups that are divided by interest. So for example, you have the sporty groups, the artistic groups. The, uh, the smart kids and right recently in our society you have the SJWs and then you have the anti-SJWs. Some groups are divided by personalities. So you have the smart ones, you have the popular kids, you have the quiet kids, you have the troublemakers, you have the nerds, you have the nerds who are trying really hard to be popular. I'm sure uh, many of you uh, know all of these groups and most of you likely belong to more than one of these groups. Some of them are by choice, but not always, because um, there are always groups that you cannot join, either because you don't have the kind of life experience that's required to, to bond and resonate with that group, or there are certain qualities about that group that you don't agree with, that you don't like, therefore you don't want to join, that, that's what, that, therefore you don't want to join them. For example, I would say that a lot of the, the a lot of the the, the, the atheists, or if you're a Hindus, you will not be joining a Christian group. Or vice versa, if you're a nerd who really care about school and does really well, you will, not, you will not be interested to join a game. Now imagine this. Let's say the creator of the universe, right? God himself comes down to earth. And because we're in a church, let's assume this is Jesus for a moment. Let's assume Jesus comes down to earth and then goes to your school or goes to your work. Who do you think he will associate with? Which group is Jesus going to join? Is it going to be the Christians? Is it going to be the ones who are trying really hard to be a good person? Is it everyone because Jesus doesn't discriminate? That's the question that we are dealing with today, friends. 
And I think it's an important one because according to the Bible, only the people who Jesus associate with will have a chance to go to heaven. That means unless Jesus is willing to join your group, you don't have a shot at heaven. That is a hard truth of the Bible. And that means if you are not a Christian today, you need to care because your eternal life is in the balance. And if you're already a Jesus follower, you still need to care because by examining which kind of people that Jesus associate with, we can reflect on ourselves to see if we are following Jesus well in this regard. So if you have your Bible, please flip it open and let's go to Mark chapter 2. If you don't have your Bible, don't worry. I'm just all going to be putting out the slides up here so you can take a look as well. We'll be looking at Mark chapter 2, verse 13 to 17 today. Verse 13 to 17. He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with the sinners and tax collector, said to his disciples, why does he eat with the tax collectors and the sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call, uh, I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. This is the word of the Lord. Before we um, go further, why don't we bow our heads? I invite you to pray with me um, as we begin. Heavenly Father, we ask that you will um, enlighten our minds today so that we can read this passage, understand it in, in its original intent, and apply it to our modern context. Father, we ask your spirit to come, guide me today as I try to explain this the best you can, and guide everyone who is online worshiping you to hear this and, and absorb it into, your, into their heart and for it to really change your life. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, for the next seven weeks, we are returning to the Gospel of Mark, which we began going through verse by verse um, last fall, if you remember. The Gospel of Mark was a document written in the 60s AD. So, it's about 30 years after Jesus died. Uh, historians believe that Jesus died around year 30 to 33. The Gospel of Mark, as you see on the screen here, was written in the 60s, probably before year 70. Now, it was, the Gospel of Mark was written by, by Mark, which the Gospel was named after, and Mark was a close friend of Peter, whom, if you're not familiar with, Peter was, is one of the closest uh, disciples of Jesus Christ himself. The Gospel of Mark was the first of four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, written about the life of Jesus. When Jesus died on the cross and resurrected three days later, in the beginning, there were so many eyewitnesses just scattered all over Israel. So that if you want to know who the, who the real Jesus is, what he has done, all you have to do is ask someone who saw it with their own eyes or even live with Jesus or follow Jesus um, in their daily lives. However, as that first generation of Christian eyewitnesses started to die out, which is after about 30 years, there came a need for somebody to put down the real events concerning Jesus because false rumors have now started to spread. And that is why, um, that is why um, Mark um, heard, what, heard, heard what Peter told him about Jesus when Peter was younger and following him and then wrote down in the form of the Gospel of Mark. Now the Gospel of Mark opened with John the Baptist introducing Jesus as the Messiah. If you remember this from right from the beginning of chapter one. And the Messiah, when, when, when John introduced Jesus as the Messiah, what he meant was that God himself is coming to save humanity. Humanity cannot save, 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 save itself. God is now coming to save. And we saw that from the very beginning of Jesus' ministry on earth, um, uh, um, he was already... Um, he was already doing all kinds of miracles. He was living like God. For the first 30 years of his life, 
um, he was he was he was living a he was living the life of a carpenter. But then, when he was around thirty years old, he revealed his true identity. He was baptized by the by John the Baptist. He um he he called his first few disciples. He started teaching about God and claiming himself to be God. He started performing miracles, and very soon his popularity ballooned, and he became to a threat to the people in charge. And starting at the beginning of chapter two, which we're which which, which that's where we left off last fall. We have a series of four encounters where Jesus went up against the authorities, and if you want to use, if you, if I have to use a modern word to describe what happened during those four encounters, it's this word, savage, savage. We have four accounts of Jesus being savage with the authorities. We saw the first of these moments last year, if you remember, when Jesus told a paralytic that his sins were forgiven. And just by saying that, it triggered a religious leader, a scribe, a Pharisee, who was questioning Jesus whether he had the authority to do that, because he rightly knew that only God can forgive sins. But then Jesus heard that, and then Jesus responded, and and said, "Let me ask you a question: Which is easier, to say to the paralytic that your sins are forgiven, or to say, 'Wait, get up, and walk'?" So then he turned over to the paralytic, and then he said, "Get up and walk," and that's exactly what the paralytic did. People were astonished at that when Jesus both forgave, forgave his sins, and then healed him on the spot, and rightfully so. If it happened today, I would be super astonished as well. Now, after that first instance of savage Jesus, he came. To town with the crowd, as we read, as we read、um, in our passage today, in verse thirteen, he came across this guy called Levi, who is the son son of Alphaeus, just sitting at the tax booth, and he walked over and then asked him to follow me. When Levi heard that, he immediately stood up, ditched his job, and followed Jesus. Now, this interaction was significant for two reasons. The first one is this: Levi, the son of Alphaeus. Later became one of the original twelve apostles, the twelve closest disciples that Jesus handpicked to follow him for three years before sending him out into the world. And Levi later changed his name to Matthew, which you may recall it's the same Matthew who wrote the Gospel of Matthew. And then, secondly, the second reason this is significant is that Matthew was a tax collector, which at the time. Was one of the most despised occupations in the entire、uh, community. Now you may be wondering, what's wrong with the tax collector? What's so bad about the tax collector? I mean, these guys were at that time they were ed- well educated, right? They they must have known their math and and calculus and advanced functions really well, and they're probably pretty rich as well. What's what's wrong with the tax collectors? And the reason lied in how they made their money. Israel at the time was occupied by the Roman government. If you did not know, that was that was this, that was the political scene in the first century Israel, and just like today, they have all kinds of taxes. Now、uh, you got the income tax, you have the property tax, you have the sales tax, you have all kinds of taxes, just like today. Now, if you have filed a tax return in Canada before, then you must have dealt with the CRA, the 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 folks at the CRA. The CRA is a official branch of the Canadian government responsible for collecting taxes, and the people at CRA are very strict, but at the same time they're also in general very fair. Therefore, even though a lot of us think that we pay too much taxes, we we take our issue up with the Canadian government, with the Prime Minister, and never at the people of CRA. But the Romans ran a different system for their colonies back then. What the Romans did was that they they said to the community that I want a basic amount of taxes from you, and then they hire a bunch of tax collectors to go get that tax for them. <laughs> However, instead of paying a fixed salary to those tax collectors, the Romans government allowed them to take commissions on what they take. So that means that means、um, the tax collectors were allowed to overcharge. And then give the basic、uh, amount to the government, and then keep the profits for themselves. So you can you can understand why why this is this is such a disgusting thing. This is why people hated、uh, this is why people hated the tax collectors so much. And to make matters worse, 
These tax collectors were not sent from Rome. Do you know where they came from? They came straight from the local communities. That means Matthew was a Jewish man extra extracting unfair profits from his own community. People like Matthew were despised and ostracized from the society. Now, if you, um, if, if you think about it, in ancient times, people discriminate, right? People ostracize people from society for all kinds of bad reasons. But in this case, Matthew, when he was ostracized, was indeed betraying his people, right? He deserved the hate that he was getting. But then that is the point. When Jesus walked over, showed up at Matthew's desk, and then said, Matthew, come follow me. Whether you grew up in church or not, you have probably heard that Jesus is a friendly, you know, a loving and accepting guy. And so far in the Gospel of Mark, we have seen how Jesus would reach out to the sick people, reach out to the demons possessed, reach out to the poor people. Basically, everyone who are oppressed by the society at no fault of their own, right? Jesus would reach out to them. But then in this case, Matthew was guilty. Matthew was guilty. He was oppressed for the right reasons. He made a fortune by scamming the poor. If you think in modern terms, Matthew is like the equivalent of the wolves of Wall Street. The wolves of Wall Street, the big banker who are scamming the, the working class people. And if you follow uh, the US and the Canadian politics, then you know that in the past 10 years, starting with Occupy Wall Street all the way until some of the recent movements, there is a lot of effort, a lot of people who want to reduce the power that's currently in the hands of these bank big bankers. Matthew is kind of like that in the ancient time. But then Jesus went and called Matthew to follow him. And Jesus did not stop there. That is one of the crazy things. He then proceeded to have dinner with all of Matthew's tax collector friends. As if just befriending with one is not enough, he has to know a bunch of them. If this happens in the modern day, I think a politically liberal, a politically progressive will be really mad at what Jesus is doing. Jesus should not be associating with people like Wall Street, the Wall Street bankers, like people like Matthew. But I would argue it's not just the liberals, because if you look at verse 16 of this passage, verse 16 says that the scribes and the Pharisees saw Jesus eating with the, the sinners, and they asked Jesus' disciple, why is your master doing that? Why is Jesus doing that? Now, if you're not familiar with the Pharisees, the Pharisees were a group of very religious Jews. They created a ton of laws, much more than what the Bible was, has required of people. And then they wanted everyone in the society to follow those rules that they, they think came from God, but in fact, they, they created themselves. And then they don't just do that. They also like to pat themselves on the back because they're good at following these rules. In their eye, they are the holy people of God. And they would look down at anyone in the society who is not following their rules. Rules. They would call themselves. Uh, they, they would call themselves unholy, full of sins, blasphemous, outsider. They would call them all of these things, and they would treat them as such. Therefore, their problem with Matthew is not just that Matthew was collecting unfair profits from the society. Their deeper problem with Matthew was that he was an unholy, full, a unholy man full of sins, a blasphemous guy in, the, in front of God. Somebody who does not obey the moral standards that the Pharisees would have set up. And I think if this was the modern day, and Jesus went over and associated with the Matthews, I think the, if you are a politically conservative person, you will probably be pretty mad at Jesus as well. Jesus shouldn't be associating with people who, dis who disregard and is so antagonistic towards the law of God. But then look at how Jesus is responding here. Jesus said, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Let me read that again. He said, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Now, notice this. Jesus did not condone 
what Matthew did. Jesus did not say what Matthew was doing was okay. He, in fact, in this past, in this verse, he acknowledged that Matthew was a sinner, and what he was doing is violating the moral laws of God. But then he said that's exactly why he came to Matthew and his friends. Do you see the dynamic here? Remember how in the beginning we said it's inevitable that we draw circles around around us and then form groups of groups of uh, groups of people within us within the society within um, the the day in, within our daily life. Well, we see here that Jesus is obviously drawing a circle too, right? He's got the Matthew and his friends, and he's got the Pharisees outside. But the criteria he used to draw those circles were really unique, and I would argue. The way that Jesus draws circles are actually the most inclusive one in the history. Let me explain. So you see, sometimes we draw circles based on the moral and the immoral people, the righteous, the sinners, the good people, the bad people, the obedient ones, and the disobedient ones. And then we said, if Jesus is truly fair. Then he would associate himself with the obedient people, with the obedient groups. Sometimes churches also think like this, don't we?、Um, we think that a God-honoring Christian is someone who follows the rules. And then when we raise our young people within the church, we kind of send this signal to them. We tell them that、um, we tell them that、um, if you listen to your parents, your teachers, your pastors, if you work hard to get good grades in school. If you go to church every week and you read your Bible, if you serve in church when you're old enough, if you don't do drugs, if you don't swear, just in general, don't be a troublemaker. When you do all these things, then we say this youth is a good Christian, worthy to be a Jesus follower. And then I think we、uh, Christians also let this kind of thinking sneak into the way that way of、um, inviting new people to our church as well. We tend to check if someone is the Obedient and moral type first before we invite them, because in our mind we think you know、uh, they probably have a better shot of of becoming Christians than a you know they have a better shot of becoming Christians than a drunk guy who cannot hold his job for more than three months. So then we invite the obedient people. We don't invite the disobedient people to church. Now let me be clear because I am not saying. That Jesus prefers the disobedient people over the obedient. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that when Jesus decides who is a worthy follower, these are not the categories he used. These are not the categories he used. Even though a true Christian, as he follows Jesus, does become more Christ-like in the sense that he will live, he or she will live a holy life in obedience to God. So in a sense, he or she will become more obedient the more、um, that he follow he or she follows Jesus. But then you can also try to be moral and obedient without Jesus, right? We see our non-Christian friends doing that. So this passage tells us that Jesus will look past this these outward behavior and then go straight to the heart. Jesus is going to come and ask, "Are you sick or not? Are you sick or not? Do you do you need a physician?" Are you a sinner or not? Do you need a savior? But on the other hand, what I find is that contemporary people don't like to separate people based on whether or not they obey God. This is not a, the category that contemporary people will accept. Instead, people have different life experiences. They will argue, and it's important that we seek to understand each other's stories as a human being, rather than to be. Judgmental of them based on our perceived moral systems, and most people I met who think this way would say that they are separating people into groups. They tend to say everyone is one big family, right? They would they would not say that they are actually separating anyone into groups. But from where I stand, I think that you, if you, if this is the way that you think, I think that you inevitably also draw circles, just like the rest of us. And the circle that you draw is this: you draw them based on the tolerant versus the intolerant. You draw them based on the open-minded, the and the bigots. You draw them based on the compassionate and understanding people, versus the judgmental people. 
And then we say, if Jesus is truly loving, if Jesus is really a God of love and acceptance, then he would definitely associate himself with the tolerant people, not the intolerant people. And what I'd like to say is that just like the previous example about obedience, there is a lot of truth to this view, right? Because we see that in this passage, Jesus indeed rejected the Pharisees, right? Jesus actually pushed back on the judgmental Pharisees. Moreover, a true Christian, as you become a deep, a, 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 as you become, as you become a more mature follower of Christ, you you can't help but become more like Jesus and become more loving, become more tolerant, and become more accepting. That is the fact of someone who who is a true Christian. But then at the same time, you can also see these qualities. You can see that people are striving after them. You can see these things without Jesus as well in our non-Christian friends, and therefore. These are also not the categories that Jesus would use when he determines who is qualified to come follow him. He would look past this way of thinking and then go straight to the heart again, just like he looked past the outward behavior and went straight to the heart. He will ask you, are you sick? Are you spiritually sick? Do you need a doctor, a physician? Are you a sinner? Will you admit that you are a sinner? Do you need a savior, friends? From Jesus' perspective, both of these ways of separate of separating people have a common problem, and that is you're always pointing your fingers outwards to someone else for the problem. If you are the obedient type, you see the disobedient as the problem. If you are the tolerant type, you see the intolerant as the problem. Either way, it's other people who are sick. It's other people who are the sinners. It's other people who are the primary problem of the society, not us. And therefore, we don't want to associate with them, and neither should Jesus. But Jesus says, and I want to emphasize this again: the way I decide who I associate with over others is whether you see yourself as the problem. So don't point fingers outside. Point them to yourself. The way Jesus decides who is qualified to follow him or not is whether that person sees himself or herself as the primary problem of the world. If you admit that you are sick and need healing, then Jesus says, "I'm here as your doctor." If you admit that you are a sinner who needs help, Jesus says, "I'm here as your Lord and as your Savior." And in my opinion, given that it is inevitable. That we have to draw circles around people. It's just human nature. It's a way of life. I believe that the way the categories that Jesus used is the most inclusive possible. There is. Now, I think sometimes well-meaning Christians、um, would give a simplistic message that Jesus accepts everyone,、um, but I think in this case we can see that that is obviously not true because Jesus clearly excluded some and included some just right in this passage. However, that statement that Jesus accepts everyone is also not completely false either. It's just not the nuanced picture. The Bible tells us that Jesus accepts everyone in the sense that your external qualities and your past histories don't matter. They don't matter to Jesus. What matter is what's in your heart at this moment. It's what's in your heart at this moment that counts. And if your heart would admit that you are a sinner, then you will be accepted by Jesus, no matter anything else. If in your heart you would stop pointing to others as the primary problem and start pointing to yourself and humble yourself and come to Jesus and follow Him, then you will be accepted, no matter anything else. So, friends, how should we apply this Bible passage to our contemporary societies? I want to give you three things. I want to talk to you about three scenarios, three examples of how, based on this passage, we can follow Jesus. Now, the first one is this: to be humble about our spiritual condition. To be humble about our spiritual conditions. The Bible tells us that deep down, we all know we are sinners before God. We know that we are sick spiritually. 
and we know that we are imperfect morally. We know when we stand before God, He is so holy and so perfect that we are not worthy. The Bible tells us that deep within our hearts, we have that sense of feeling. We know. And I think it's the big reason why self-help books are so popular these days. And why so many of us want to try different techniques to try to suppress this feeling of inadequacy. And sometimes we feel that we have done too many, just too many bad things in life. We feel that we have done so many bad things in life and we, we, are, we feel sorry and we hate that part of ourselves. Um, we think church is for people who have their life together, not for somebody who's a troublemaker or as messed up as I am. We believe that we don't deserve to be forgiven and therefore is not qualified to follow Jesus. We believe that we can follow Jesus. Now, I think it's possible for you to feel this way because you have a low, low, uh, low confidence. You really don't think that you deserve anyone's love and forgiveness, let alone Jesus. Perhaps the bad things that you have committed was not just a one-time thing, it's a recurring thing. Perhaps it's ongoing in your life right now and you hate yourself for that. But friends, as a student of the Bible, I have to tell you that the love of Jesus is so much more than you can imagine. Because the Bible is clear that nothing Nothing can ever separate you from the love of God as exhibited on the cross when Jesus went there to die for your sins. And this love, when Jesus was on the cross, is forever secure for you. It's forever secure for you, no matter what you have done before. And if you truly humble yourself right, and admit that you are a sinner and you come to Jesus, you will be accepted. You are qualified if you truly humble yourself and come. But I also find that that is not that low conf, low self confidence is not the only reason we feel that we are not good enough to follow Jesus. I've met people who actually put their identity into being the bad apple, right? Um, they secretly enjoy how they are standing out among the crowds because they are the because uh, um. Because while other people might be only a little bit bad, they are really, really, really bad. And they love that fact about them. They try to maintain that reputation about them. And because of this, they truly believe that they are so bad that not even Jesus can redeem them. Maybe they don't, they don't even want Jesus to redeem them. They want to stay bad so that they can stand out. They feel special this way. And if this is you, you need to know that Jesus is God himself. He is God himself who laid down his life for you. And when he does that, his blood has infinite worth. Right? It can cover every possible thing that you have ever committed, every wrong that you have ever committed. There is nothing you can ever do where when you come to Jesus in repentance and faith, he cannot wipe clean from your slate. So the real question is not whether Jesus can redeem you. Of course he can. The real question is whether you will admit that Jesus can redeem you. Whether you will admit, whether you're humble enough to admit Jesus can redeem you and you come and you let him. Second, be the same person everywhere. Be the same person everywhere. Because you see here, when Jesus called Matthew to follow him, Matthew did not separate his life into a Christian version in a non-Christian version, right? He took Jesus to his tax collector friends. How often do you do that, friends, if you, if, you, if you say that you follow Jesus? I think that in the same way, when we follow Jesus, we need to bring Jesus into all parts of our life as well. There cannot be a Christian version of you and a non-Christian version of you outside the Christian community. Even if you think that the people that you're hanging out with are not the kind of people that Jesus would associate with. Even if that's true, we still need to have the integrity, like Matthew, to be the same person everywhere and to bring just bring Jesus over to the non-Christian part of our life. So brothers and sisters, I think if this is true for your life right now, then I will encourage you to bring this to God and ask Him to help you to be a good testimony among your friends, among your colleagues at lunchtime, and your cadets, when you're having those fun and jokes that you're not supposed to have, 
these are the times when you can show your integrity and be the same person everywhere. Lastly, trust in Jesus' power to change hearts. Trust in Jesus' power to change hearts. If you are already a follower of Jesus, then let this message be an opportunity for you to reflect if you are reaching out to the same people group that Jesus did. When you determine who to invite to church or who to share your faith with, do you focus on the people with similar qualities or, um, as you? As you, do you do you do you only um do you only go do you, do you only share your faith with the people who are the obedient type, or the tolerant type, or other qualities that you may hold dear? I think this passage shows us that in the end, it comes down to the heart. These way of thinking, these external qualities, no longer matter. It comes down to the heart. Do they see themselves as spiritually sick in need of a doctor? Do they have what it takes to humble themselves and to admit that they are a sinner who needs a savior? Do they? Now, friends, I think if you truly ask those questions, here's what you'll realize. There's no way you can know. There's no, there's just no way you can know. You, you might be able to observe their behavior. You might be able to learn some of their way of thinking by talking to them. But in the end, only God knows their heart. And therefore, don't filter anyone out in your life when you decide who you want to bring to Jesus, who you want to bring Jesus to. Don't filter anyone out. Bring them to Jesus and let Jesus deal with their hearts and then watch God works powerfully when we do that. There's a saying among Christians that is very suitable for this passage, I think. And the saying is this, the church is a hospital for sinners, not a museum of saints. The church is a hospital for sinners, not a museum of saints. If you are a true follower of Jesus, then I think it is your responsibility to make this a reality. It is your job to make sure the church is a hospital for sinners, not a museum of saints. If you only associate with people who think and act like you in real life, if your church is full of the people who are the same kind of people as you are, if you are... Um, if you, if you only invite people who are like you to church, then I think that this passage encourages us to really step out of our comfort zone and to rely more on Jesus' powerful work. So friends, as we draw to a close, let us summarize. Let us remind ourselves of the tr great truth that we have learned today. Who is qualified to follow Jesus? Who is qualified to follow Jesus? not about being good it's not about being open-minded but it's about being humble and admitting you are a sinner in need of a savior if that is true then you are qualified to follow jesus why don't we bow our heads in prayer <sighs> heavenly father i pray that you will let this truth be convicting to us for those of us who are using a different categories than what, Jesus, what your son Jesus used to determine who is qualified uh, to follow you, Father, I pray that you will enlighten us after today and help us to live according to this. And Father, for those of us who, um, who, uh, who believe that we are so bad, that we are so messed up, that we don't deserve to follow Jesus, or that we are so good, we are so tolerant, we are so obedient, that we don't need to follow Jesus. Father, for both of those groups, I pray that you will let this truth be convicting so that both groups will humble themselves and admit that they are sinners. And yet, your blood on the cross has covered their sins so that they can freely and boldly come to your presence and receive eternal life. Father, I pray for our church that as we move out um, of Sunday and go into the rest of our week, that even during this pandemic, we will be reaching out to the people um, who, who, are, who, are, who, who are sick and who are sinners the way that your son Jesus has showed us 2,000 years ago. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. I hope that was a convicting and a 